So during this series, Jesus is everybody, um, we plan to take a closer look at who he is and what it means for us as we choose to follow him. This is not going to be a series around the question that Jesus addressed his disciples with in Matthew chapter 16, who do you say that I am? Honestly, at this point, I don't want to know who you say, who I say he is. I want to get into the word and I want to figure out who he says that he is so that you and I can continue to build and base who he is on what he says rather than what culture is saying. Some of us are so ignorant and illiterate in the Bible that we don't even know who Jesus says that he is. And so we think that he is somebody's Facebook post. Or we think that he is the Instagram influencer or the TikTok little uh, booty wiggler. You know what I'm saying? That's who we think Jesus is. This is going to be a series focused in on who he says that he is. And believe it or not, man, Jesus talked about who he was a lot. And if we just read the Bible sometimes, it's like, oh, just open your eyes to who Jesus is. We believe that personal revelation of who Jesus is causes our lives to change. And so we want to lean into what Jesus says. In the book of John, Jesus makes seven statements. They're called I am statements. And I think it's cool that those statements are, they are statements, but really they're declarations. Jesus is saying, I am. I am. And I'm not filling in the blanks because we'll do that over the next couple of weeks. And I want you to be here because this series, I think, is going to change your life. And I believe that it's significant. But it reminded me of when I was looking through John, it reminded me of some scripture that I read a long time ago in the book of Exodus, okay? And here's what I need you to know, that when Jesus spoke these I am statements, what it did was reminded me of who the Father actually is as well and the way that he introduced himself. These seven statements in the book of John, they're the Greek word, so Greek in the New Testament. Book of John is in the New Testament or the New Covenant, which many of us are familiar with after Jesus paying the price for our lives on the cross, laying his life down, raising again, and ascending to the right hand of the Father. Now we live in the New Testament, okay? Well, this New Testament was written in Greek, and the word, the Greek word for this I am statement is... Boom. It's called I me, okay? And it means this, to be, to exist, to happen, or to be present. To be, to exist, to happen, and to be present. And I thought this was so cool because, again, this, this uh, I am statement reminded me of one of the first times Jesus or God showed up to somebody and introduced himself. And it was in Exodus chapter number 3. Okay, so uh, Exodus chapter 3, God shows up. He introduces himself to a guy named Moses who was working for his father-in-law herding sheep while on the run from the law. Okay, how many of y'all know this sounds like the kind of son-in-law we're all looking for, right? Yeah, running from the law, wanted for murder. Yes, son-in-law, let's go. So we put him like we would with our son-in-law, out away so nobody can encounter him at all. But God shows up to Moses in a burning bush and he speaks to him about returning to Egypt, which was the place where he was wanted for murder. And he wanted him to return to Egypt specifically to free God's people from captivity and bondage that they'd been living in for around 400 years. And this is where we pick up uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 11 says this, but Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered him, I will be with you. This is your sign that I, am, that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship the God, worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they'll ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses and he said, I am who I am. Th say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you to me, sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Okay, so one quick connection that I want to make. I am in the New Testament where Jesus was talking is that Greek word I me, right? I am in the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, is a different word. Haya. Somebody say haya. It's not karate, but it's close, okay? Haya. It means to be, become, come to pass, exist, or to happen. Can you flip back to I me real quick? Look at the definition. Now they're going to flip back to I me. Look. To be, to exist, to happen, to be present. Now flip to Haya. To be, become, come to pass, exist, or happen. They're different words from different languages, but they mean the same thing. And we need to understand this as we're looking at these terms because we need to understand that what God is saying to us through these two portions of Scripture is this. I am the God who was in the Old Testament. I am the God who is with you now. And I am the God who will be. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the God who encountered Moses is the same God who encountered Jesus and who encounters you and I right now today. The same God that we met with this morning is the same God who met with Moses at the burning bush. Is the same God who walked the face of the earth in the person of Jesus. It's the same God. God. And what we need to know and the reason that it's so important that these are closely connected is because the same power, the same spirit that was afforded to Moses in that moment was afforded to Jesus later on is now afforded to you and I. Where we'll never ever be alone. No matter what we find ourselves in the midst of. No matter how many times we disqualify ourselves or count ourselves out. We're so caught up and concerned about who I am, but God is only concerned about and caught up in who he is and who he can be in you and me. Yeah, How many times have you disqualified yourself from being able to move forward in something that God has said because you're like, mm, not me. Who am I to believe for another marriage? Who am I to believe for a business? Who am I to believe that my marriage can make it? Who am I to believe? Who am I to show up to Pharaoh? Who am I to bring freedom? Who am I to show up in the place where I raised hell for my whole life and plant a church and expect God to do something great? Who am I? See, you and I get caught up in who I am, but God is only caught up in who he is. And this is what we have to be aware of. The importance of this, because there are things that change when we begin to take our eyes off of us and put our eyes on him. Yeah. See, naturally, you and I will always and forever want to look at ourselves first just because we tend to be the object of our obsession, don't we? Think about it. Your kids are born and everybody's all googly eyed, like, ooh, ah, you know, over them. And they learn from a very young age to be the center of all attention. Many of us are 40, 50, 60, 70, and we still are the object of our obsession. We can't believe that everybody doesn't stop and ooh and ah over us anymore. Right? Isn't that how we live our lives? And some of y'all may say, not me. Okay, okay, cool. That's fine, that's fine. There's got to be some change, though, and here are three things that change with I am. When we get our eyes off of am I and we put our eyes on I am, who is God? Number one is fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. The first thing that changes is who you fear. Many of us fear people. We fear what they will think. We fear what they will say. We fear what they will do. We always keep ourselves small and locked out of a place of pleasing God when our eyes are focused on others. See, you might say, well, that's not me. But if you think, what will they say? What will they do? What will they 
thing. Your eyes might be more fixed on you than you thought. Which is okay. It's totally normal. That's why we have to encounter the I am. Otherwise, we'll be constantly caught in a place of am I. Many of us, <clears throat> what we'll do is focus in on ourselves. And as we do that, we will fear people. And what happens when we fear people is we get bound up with stress, anxiety, and depression. This is the trap that the enemy wants to keep us caught in. And some of us don't deal with stress. We don't deal with anxiety. We don't deal with depression. And so you're probably thinking to yourself, praise God, man, that's not my world. But your world might be being in control, being driven, being a perfectionist or a workaholic. Can I tell you something? This is simply the other side of the same coin. All of these things, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, control, being driven, perfectionist and workaholism, can I tell you what they are? They're fear and their pride. Pride is fear dressed up and fear is pride dressed down. Both are the same coin, just opposite sides. When I'm operating in pride, I'm fearful of what other people are thinking about me. When I operate in, in fear, stress, anxiety, depression, all, I'm fearful of what people are thinking about me. I'm focused on am I rather than on I am. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? And so the first thing that happens, what, uh, what the first thing that changes when we fix our focus on the I am rather than am I is our fear changes and we begin to fear God rather than fear people. Many of us, I believe God wants to break the power of fear of people over our lives today. Whether it manifests in you through stress, anxiety, or depression, or whether it's control, being a perfectionist, driven, and there are many others. I believe that God wants to break that over your life because it's, 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 in, it's, it's, keeping, you, it's keeping you from the fullness of what God has for you. The second thing that changes is our focus. Because our focus tends to be on what we can see, specifically what we can see in me, right? The reason that Moses was focused on am I, who, who am I? The reason he was focused on that because he was focused on what he could see what he could see specifically in himself. He saw that he was a murderer. He saw that he was, um, he saw he was adopted. He saw that he wasn't, you know, an heir to the throne necessarily. He saw that he was a misfit even among his people that God had called him back to. So he saw himself in an incomplete way, which I think many of us might see ourselves incomplete. But I, but I got to let you know, Many of us believe that fear is the opposite of faith, but it's not. Sight is the opposite of faith. Because if you say, I got to see it in order to believe it, it will keep you bound forever. You will not walk into the things that God's speaking if you can't see them, and that will keep you bound in fear because your focus is in the wrong place. It's not fear ultimately, it's sight. Have you ever said, I believe it when I see it? That's the opposite of faith. Faith believes in it even when it doesn't see it. This brother gets up and starts talking about a Bible college. He says, okay, five students. You know what I'm talking about? Faith, right? Starts talking about it's faith, it's faith, it's faith. Stop focusing on what you can see and start focusing on what God sees in you. See, because when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees his son, Jesus. He sees something complete. He sees something whole. He doesn't see something broken. He sees something whole. And so the reality of the situation is we want to be people who don't, don't just look at what we can see, but we look at what God can see because God sees in us who we can be. He sees the redeemed you. He sees the fulfilled you. He sees the, the, the renewed you. He sees the bought and paid for you. You see all the stuff behind the scenes and why you can't and why you shouldn't and why you don't, but he sees why you are. 
and what you will be and where you can go. That's what he sees. And he only speaks to you based on what he sees, not what you see. How many times have you talked yourself out of something because your focus has been on what you see rather than on what God sees even when you can't see it? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. He knows who we can be in him if we're living by faith. He knows who we can be because he knows who he is. He doesn't call you based on who you are. He calls you based on who he is. He knows that everything he speaks over you is not based on you, it's based on him. And so if he leads you there, if he guides you there, he will provide for you there. He will make a way for you there. It will require faith and you will absolutely be beyond yourself. You ever heard somebody say God won't give you more than you can handle? Eh, wrong. He will always give you more than you can handle. If he didn't, it wouldn't require faith. He will always put more on you than you can handle. So if what you're doing is living with, if if you can accomplish everything that you're called to by the means that you currently have, then you're not living the fullness of what God has for you. Can I call you to a higher level? Come on, everybody. Come on by faith in the name of Jesus. It's time to level up. It's time to go further. You thought this was the end of it. It's not the end of it. Come on. Man, God has called you to conquer. You thought, you thought your 20s and your 30s were the time of your life and now you're 40, 50, 60 and you're just settling. Give me a break, man. God has called you to more. He's called you to more faith. He's called you to rely on him even more. I believe with all that I am that what God is saying right now over our church, and this is scripture, but I believe it's a word for us. There are people in here who have begun to settle for what they've accomplished so far. But can I tell you something? You're not setting the tone for anybody by by stopping with what you've accomplished so far. The generations that come after us, they're not going to live based on what we've already accomplished. They're going to live on what they see us accomplishing now, currently. Why should our dreams die? They shouldn't. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. But who am I? Doesn't matter. He's I am. This is the next thing that changes. So your focus changes, fear changes, but your future changes. Your future changes. Your future changes. Somebody say my future changes. changes. My future changes. I had no idea when I was 18 years old and I met Jesus. He rescued me from the depths of my sin. He rescued me from the place where I was disconnected. I'll never forget the downward spiral spiral that I was living. I thought my life was destined for the same stuff that generations before me had lived. Marriage, adultery, divorce, addiction, abuse. I thought that's what I was destined for. I'll never forget walking out of the abortion clinic in Omaha knowing that I had fallen so far and come so short. But not knowing what to do about it. I'll never forget the way that I drowned my sorrows. More sex, more drugs, more alcohol, more abuse. But I'll never forget the way that God so graciously and mercifully showed up to me. And I didn't know it at the time. I thought that God was just changing me in the moment. And I was so grateful for that because, man, I needed that moment changed. I didn't know that God was rewriting 
my entire future. I didn't know that at 18 years old, he was calling me out from among the places and the people that I had been. When all I had to do was say, who am I? He said, man, it doesn't matter who you are because I am the one who is sending you. I didn't know that a decision to move to Illinois and then a decision to marry a pretty girl and a decision to move to Georgia and start a family and just take the next right step. See, I was never tempted to think that I had to figure it all out at one time. I knew I wasn't that smart. But some of you are, and you got to stop. Because your future is tied up in the next right step. Not five steps from now. Not two steps from now. The next right step. And some of you have been sitting here under this preaching and teaching for months and years. And you've yet to take your next step. You said, who am I? Who am I to expect something more? Who am I to expect something different? It doesn't matter who you are. He is I am. And it's time to move. Because your next right step affects your future. The people who are coming behind you and their next right step. The people who follow you right now are they encouraged in their future by the next right steps you're taking? Or do they think that they're going to be limited just like you? And some of you, I'm telling you, your limitations are way up here. And you, everybody looks at you on the outside and think, man, these guys got it together. But you're limited because you're not taking your next right step. Others of us are down here. And we're feeling limited. But can I tell you something? Limitations, 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 limitations. It doesn't matter if it's down here, up here, or up here. What's your next right step? Are future generations going to be affected in a positive way? A negative way? Or even worse, just status quo? Well, I got to a certain place and I just hit cruise. Come on, that's not the life you're called to. What are you afraid of? I'm not afraid of anything. Y'all, please make sure you have my back after service. I see on some people's faces they want to fight. I won't back down. Can I tell you something? I love you. God loves you more. And we've got to stop being those people who say, who am I? And start, start declaring, who am I to deny what the Lord can do? I've got no education. Every week somebody asks me, where'd you go to seminary? I'm like, didn't. What, what degree do you have? Don't. Every week somebody asks me, Maybe this week nobody will. <laughs> Who am I to deny what God can do? I want to I want to I want to start getting out of the way. I've done so much to slow him down at this point. I'm just like, let, just let me get out of the way. Let him be I am. Can I tell you something? I am sent you. Where you are, in your workplace, in your career, in your family, in your marriage, I am has sent you. Stop, stop asking, who am I to go? You're the guy, you're the gal, you're the, you're the son, you're the daughter, you're the mom, you're the dad, you're the business owner that God sent there. Well, I don't know if God sent me there. I wasn't really living for God before I, I started. God sent you there. You think 
that you are smart enough, good enough, gifted enough to end up in the place where you are and God didn't orchestrate it, you are crazy and God sent you there for a reason because there's a kingdom that he's trying to advance. There's a people that he's trying to move. There's a future generation that he's trying to change. You were sent where you are. I am sent you. I am sent you. I am sent you. He sent you. He sent you. He sent you. You're not here on accident. You've been sent by I am. You've been sent by I am. Pastor Matt, you don't know the hell that I'm in the middle of. I do know this, that I am has sent you to the place where you are and he will sustain you right there because he always was, he is, and he will always be.